Good morning and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for connecting on uh, this week's weekly mentoring hour. We usually begin with a word of prayer, so we'll do that. And then after uh, that, I'll introduce our speaker for today, and uh, we will move ahead with our mentoring hour. I'd like to request um, any of our students on the call today to please go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this hour of mentoring, Father. We, we As we commit this time into their hands, we pray that uh, you will minister to us through thy word and what we learn, Father. We pray that we'll be able to not only apply it in our own lives, Father, but be able to, to use it to be a blessing to others, Father. We, we pray for a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, this morning, we have our very own Jean George, one of our faculty. Uh, all of you are familiar uh, as she's taking our Christian counseling, uh, marriage and family um, courses. Uh, and she's a trained um, you know, psychologist. And she will today help us understand how we can help those with suicidal thoughts. So I just hand it over to Jean. Uh, Jean, over to you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today we have uh, quite an important topic that we'd like. I'd like to uh, focus on because, as part of our ministry, as part of us meeting people, even on a regular basis, uh, we may have come across those who um, fall into this category of having suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations probably um, people who you've come across who's, um, who has a mental health issue of depression um, or going through serious pressures, serious concerns in life. So um, I really hope, uh, you know, I know the, the time is really short, but in that 10 minutes, I'd just probably like to encapsulate certain uh, key points. I may not be able to bring up everything, but key points on what we need to know and we need to understand as uh, we deal with people. So before we get started, um, uh, you know, I just like to, before we get to that topic, uh, I just want to reiterate that it is important to know uh, that God is the owner and the giver of our lives. And um, uh, in Jeremiah 10, 23, it reiterates that, uh, th that the way of man is not uh, himself, meaning that uh, our lives are not our own. We do not, we do not uh, hold our lives in our hands to do what we please with it. But that life is a precious gift from God and is not to be abandoned or misused. And we also recognize that God, um, as our Creator, is the only one who is to decide when and uh, and how a person should should die as the psalmist says my times are in your hands uh, i've just just bought this up just for us to really have an understanding that um, suicide is is uh, not is a violation of god's law for our lives for god's desire and purpose for our lives and we need to recognize this before we get into the the topic as a whole so um, uh, before we we look at uh, uh, how do we help people, I just wanted to um, probably get a, a, a quick, a brief definition of uh, these these different terms. Um, so there are three terms that you know I'd, I'd like us to just keep in mind. One is suicide, and suicide is defined as death that is caused by injuring oneself or harming oneself with the specific intent to kill themselves or to die. Uh, suicide attempt is when someone harms themselves with uh, any intent to end their lives, but they do not die uh, as, a, as a result of their actions. It is an attempt that is made. The intent is there, but however, the result may not lead to death. Um, the suicidal thoughts, or as we may sometimes call it as ideations, can mean having thoughts or abstract thoughts about ending one's life or feeling that people 
would be better off without you. Or, or it also can mean um, thinking about methods of suicide or really making intentional, clear plans to take one's own life. So there are, there are thoughts and there are ruminations about giving up one's life. Um, now, before uh, before we know how we can support, I think it's important to understand that as spiritual leaders, uh, each of us are uniquely positioned to help prevent suicides. But um, but you know, we, I've, I've kind of seen, and you know, we we probably also sometimes often hesitate to really embrace this role. So. Um, uh, and, and very often we see that we may be reluctant to talk about this topic because we don't know what to say and we are afraid that we may say the wrong thing. But I trust that, um, you know, these uh, the 10-minute the topic that we have, this will really help us rethink certain assumptions we may have about suicide, uh, also prepare ourselves to have conversations about suicide and also recognize that um, we don't have to be counselors or we don't have to be therapists or psychologists to really discuss uh, uh, the hopeless feelings that people have and how we could really influence and um, help people to make right choices about the life that God has given to them. OK, um, now, so to move on, I think the first and foremost important thing we need to do, we need to know before we can support is needing to learn how to spot the warning signs. Uh, very often, um, you know, people do give out clues or give out certain signs uh, that they would like to um, end their lives. And this is almost like a cry for help, like a call for attention. So being informed about these warning signs can often help us to support them, uh, uh, sp support especially those who may be thinking about suicide. So here are just some warning signs. And there are basically, we look at it in three categories, in the way that they talk, in the way that they behave, and the way that you may observe their mood. And uh, remember, uh, these are not just in, um, no, please don't look at just one isolating point as an indication towards suicide, but you may, you may really need to, if you were to uh, know any one of these signs, maybe probe a little more. And that's what we're going to be looking at, how we can support. So uh, just to add a little bit about what are some warning signs about the way they talk is they may speak about how they are experiencing unbearable pain or they may talk about how they are a burden to others. And we see this uh, a lot. Um, usually, uh, a lot of people who have suicidal attempt bring about this, that they don't want to be a burden to somebody else. Or they may have a talk about killing themselves or ending things, um, things up. Um, they may discuss about not having a purpose to live, not having a reason to live. Or they may talk about feeling extremely trapped, feeling uh, feeling as if they are chained in this cloud of of heaviness or this cloud of burden. So these are some things that uh, you you can look out for that they may that they may actually express to you. Um, what do you look at in behavior? In behavior, um, some of the key hallmark signs that you would see is how they withdraw from activities. They may withdraw from social settings, withdrawing away from work, you're actually seeing that uh, uh, you're seeing a stark difference from where they were, uh, where, where they were to where they are. Uh, another behavior that you would notice is the uh, usage of certain substances, maybe alcohol or drugs or getting uh, getting into some form of an addiction to keep themselves away from uh, having having these thoughts. Um, the, the other behavior that you could see is uh, acting recklessly, um, uh, being uh, taking a lot of risks uh, that 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 could tend to uh, self harm, or uh, they they could be looking for way to kill themselves. You know, maybe searching online for materials or means of how they could kill themselves. Uh, another behavior that you would notice is an isolation from family and friends. Um, something that usually people do say, especially when they are extremely de depressed, is their inability to sleep, that is, they're sleeping too little, 
or they're sleeping too much. Um, another thing that we've noticed is um, uh, some of these people visit or call people to say goodbye. They kind of ensure that they keep things uh, in order, especially if, if they are, let's say, breadwinners of the home or, you know, maybe maybe someone who has a responsibility for the entire family. They may write up a will. They may close a bank account, keep the money somewhere for the, for the family to use. So certain behaviors that indicate that they are trying to wrap up things so that, uh, you know, that the things are that they, that the families or people who are they leaving behind don't feel burdened to carry on certain activities again writing notes and uh, sharing that it isn't anybody's responsibility uh, if uh, if they were they were found dead you know so these are certain behaviors that you look for as warning warning signs or also uh, that sometimes there are uh, uh, significant mood changes that they will be and this can range not just uh, feeling depressed or feeling sad but it can even move into rage into irritability into aggression into a sense of humiliation, or it can come in anywhere in mid where there is anxiety, where there is a loss of interest. So uh, collectively, if you look at all um, these three, these three, uh, these three areas, the, the way they talk, the way they behave, as well as their mood, could probably be ways that that really gives you an understanding of um, what you should be looking out for. Now, moving on, uh, it is it can be difficult to talk to someone who you may think is suicidal. And sometimes it's hard to know what to do to begin um, uh, to help someone who is suffering. But taking action is always a good choice. And there are simple actions that can really help you to be there for someone who's experiencing suicidal thoughts or uh, even recovering from an attempt to take their life. So the first step is to ask and find out, to ask and find out whether the person is in danger of acting on suicidal feelings. Now, often, and I think I've heard this very often, that if you ask them, they will probably you know, feel like doing it even more. But the evidence actually shows asking someone if they're suicidal can actually protect them. By asking someone directly about suicide, you're actually giving them permission to tell you how they feel and let them know that they are not a burden. So people who have felt suicidal will often say what a huge relief it was to be able to talk about what they were they were experiencing. So it's important to be sensitive, but it is to really ask some questions. And I've just put out a couple of questions here, you know, so that we we probably you know have an idea, maybe certain clues of what we can ask. So one, how are you coping with what's been happening in your life, especially if you know that there has been a significant life event? Uh, this is a question that you can ask. Uh, do you ever feel like, do you ever just feel like giving up? Are you thinking about dying? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Have you ever thought about suicide before or tried to harm yourself before? Have you thought about how and when you do it? And again, a very direct question, do you have access to things that can be used as weapons to harm uh, harm to harm yourself. Now, these questions are important because it uh, it lets you it uh, it lets you uh, um, uh, come to to direct questions and you know direct pointers to really understand. Now, if someone does let you know that they are having suicidal thoughts, it's important to take them seriously. You don't. Um, have to be able to solve their problems, but it is to offer support and really encourage them to talk about what they uh, what they're actually feeling. And that leads us to the next action, which is a very simple one, which is to listen. You know, so if the person um, uh, if the person uh, uh, is able or knows that they can share what they are feeling with you. Um, a, they, they actually talk a lot more. So it is usually better to listen and and gen and respond with open questions and not advise and bring about opinions. So sometimes when we hear someone uh, 
uh, someone talking about suicide, the the first thing that comes about is how can I how can I get them to um, think otherwise? So 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 we may we may we may bring about insensitive remarks that really put them off from actually sharing sharing more. So it's important not to argue with them or even minimize their pain or offer advice. It's just important to listen and to be present. So the important thing uh, is to let the person know that you will support them without judgment as far as you are able to. The next thing that you would um, like to do is really, as you are listening and you know, as you continue listening, one of the important things to do is to really determine the severity of their suicidal thoughts. Now, if a conversation indicates that there are suicidal thoughts, it's really crucial to understand what that severity is. So there are four factors which really indicate that the person may require intervention uh, needed right away. One is intent. That is when they say, I want to end my life. They, they are intentional about doing it. When there is the second one is a plan. That is, they know how they're going to do it. They have planned out what are the what are the ways that they will do it. The means, the means is uh, having access to what they need to do this. Maybe, uh, maybe it's some material, it's a weapon, uh, it's some substance that they have kept within themselves, the means. And the fourth one is the timeline. That is, they have picked out a date and a time for this to happen. So they, they're, they're planning well ahead of time. So there are four factors, the intent, the plan, the means, and the timeline. So these are important because even as you're talking, you begin to understand the severi severity of it. Now, once you have determined that, it is next to notify, which is to um, to let some to get support. So if someone is passively suicidal, that means they don't have a plan, they don't have a means, they don't have an intent, they don't have a timeline. It is it is good to encourage them to seek treatment and maybe offer to contact um, uh, some professional help. Uh, but it's important to stay involved and follow up regularly to offer that kind of a support. But if you see someone is actively suicidal, um, it is okay to breach that confidentiality by letting them know and share this with the person that you would need to enlist. Maybe it's the support of a family member or someone to ensure that you keep them safe and to instruct that person or that family member, one, to remove all kinds of means that the person may have access to, which may be knives, which may be um, uh, uh, um, which may be any kind of acids, you know, toilet cleaners, medication, um, or, or anything that can potentially potentially cause harm. So that's that's important that you do, and then following up to ensure that they get the support and the help that they need. What do we do after that? Is Yes, we continue. We go ahead, uh, pray, letting the person know that um, God cares about them and their situations. Now, even as I'm saying this, we do this after hearing, listening, being there, uh, not being judgmental, having notified, maybe like like at, at the end of a conversation, right? Um, and that, you know, asking that you'd like to pray for them and asking for the Lord's, Lord's help. And here are some suggestions of things that you can pray for, that, um, you know, they would know how much God loves and values them, that uh, God would bring them to a place of healing and comfort and hope, that they would have the strength and the courage to seek uh, help, um, that they would know that God is in control, um, that they would, uh, you know, that that this this would be a beginning, a, a new chapter in their lives. That God would really open up things uh, that is uh, that that He has in store for them, and of course, anything else that God brings into your heart, in your mind. Um, uh, to let the Holy Spirit guide you. And the last thing that we could, that we need to continue doing is to stay connected. So people who are su suicidal are often desperately lonely. And uh, social isolation is a risk factor for death by suicide. So suicide prevention begins with caring enough for others to really notice that something has gone wrong. Now, uh, so to, to ensure that you're always in connection, to just to maybe check on how they're doing, whether they have been able to seek that support and help, whether they've had they have been to a doctor, maybe speaking the word to them, encouraging them, getting them uh, back to maybe 
uh, things in 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 the community, in church, maybe at work, ensuring that your connection continues with them. Um, it's also as a church, what can we do to really prevent suicide? And and I just and I've just listed three points. I, I know there may be much more, but just three important things. The first one is to be able to deal with misconceptions. Now, misconceptions about suicide and faith often misinforms those who are actually dealing with suicidal thoughts. And many people believe that depression is a sign of a lack of faith. And uh, this can cause guilt for those having that, con uh, uh, that condition. So maybe a simple advice to just pray or have more faith may may not may may look like a very sympathetic advice but but that could could come off as as something that they feel extremely even more guilty about um the truth is that even christians as believers we're not immune to mental health challenges and uh faith you know may, uh, and just having that good faith is not a guaranteed shield against any kind of a maybe a depression or an anxiety so mental illness of any kind is not an indication that a person isn't following god and it doesn't mean that you know god can't use their condition or things that they're going through for his glory the second one is to encourage that they get help so churches can combat this stigma by actually encouraging those wrestling with depression or anxiety to seek care that's appropriate to their needs. So maybe to have a list of qualified counselors or psychiatrists or any other kind of experts that can be helpful. And of course, encourage them to get help from, uh, from, the, uh, from uh, the church or from ministries that they may be involved in so that they can be together. And the last is to bring hope. So as Christ's body, uh, we as the church is responsible to demonstrate God's love to those who are hurting. And we can seek out those who are struggling and make those efforts to listen and actually offer encouragement. So uh, we can provide help in any, any, any practical way also. We can pray with them. Um, uh, also, you know, to, to um, looking for supernatural healing, to really ask God to infuse that hope back into their lives, and also really asking God to give them the grace to deal with uh, with the challenges that they may be going through, and also leading them to the right kind of options. So these are specifically three things um, uh, that that we could really focus on. Um, to just end, I have a small. Um, uh, a one minute audio clip of someone uh, who was in counseling sessions with me. This is not somebody from uh, from our circle and I've taken their permission to uh, to play this to you. Uh, but there is no uh, specific details of their uh, uh, of their uh, of their personal demographic demographics. But I just wanted you to hear what this person had to say. The person which is still Oh. And when one gathers the courage and talks about this to near and dear ones, friends, family. Uh, hi, Jean. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. The volume is, uh, it could be louder. It's louder? It no, it's, it's, uh, it's, we can't hear you. Oh, oh, we can't hear the person very well. OK, all right. Um, I I don't know how to do that. Um, then I guess uh, maybe I could send it as a clip later, probably. But uh, I think it's at the highest volume here. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'd be uh, able all right. to do that. Then maybe you could just play it, and we can, uh, all of us could probably just increase the volume on our end. So we'll go ahead and listen to it uh, anyhow. And okay. then maybe you can send it also. Sure, sure, sure. I'll do yeah. that. When a person reaches a state of considering suicide, it's a big, big step because of despair, helplessness, not seeing a way forward. 
and when one gathers the courage and talks about this to near and dear ones, friends, family, usually in all good intentions, the, the words that the person here would say, you have a lot to do, uh, think about the family, you have, you have the loved ones you are leaving behind, uh, nothing is worth this, and such. And trust me, the person is not in a frame of mind to listen to our needs. When I was in that situation, the best thing that I heard was, I understand and it's okay. And that was the turning point to start dealing with that and gathering the courage to live with it. Yeah, so um, so just just to, um, uh, you know, and I think you've heard it from the person himself about how it was just important for uh, his listener to just be able to be there, to be in that pain, to be present in all that they were going through because it actually helped them to work through and, uh, you know, work out of that. So this person uh, who who actually gave this, this clip, um, uh, was going through a very, very serious event and had actually uh, his uh, those four things that I said, the intent, the means and the timeline, they, the plan, they were all well established and he had even booked his tickets to a certain destination he was going to. He had planned it all well, but just that conversation where there was a place where he was understood, he was listened to without judgment actually helped him turn around. Uh, thank you so much for your patient listening. Uh, over to you, uh, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Jean. Uh, truly insightful. I know this is a subject that we all think about and we do come across uh, loved ones, friends who may be going through um, the you know the phases that you spoke about and having suicidal thoughts um, uh, and uh, I'm sure there are a lot many questions that uh, many of us have so uh, we'll just open up this time for questions and uh, uh, I want to invite all of us to please go ahead you know Jean is on the call uh, you can go ahead and uh, ask your questions and uh, let's just have a, a, an enriching time of discussion here uh, you may either unmute and ask the question or even uh, post it on the chat and uh, I'll I'll keep reading it out to Jean. So please feel free to do it either way. Hi, Jean. Good morning. My name is Jinsi. Thank you for the session today. It has come at a really important time. Yesterday, I met uh, three young men from the slums that I work who are, uh, one has attempted to, to die by suicide three times already. Culturally, there is the context of, uh, first of all, the age, the adolescent age, combined with the, the fact that there's an existing usage of substances, drugs, and alcohol at a very young age, and uh, exposure to very toxic family dynamics. And, uh, you know, culturally, it's also lauded to go through with it. So I found myself when I reached the location, the parents saying, don't, you know, don't even ask him that you know. It was very difficult. I was put in a very difficult situation to, you know, work with the young man. Um, I had to explore that topic slowly by, you know, uh, saying that I've come here to pray for you and then lead into that topic uh, very indirectly than directly. I know that direct is the best. I could not explore what were the trigger warning signs, but of course it's a, I know the backdrop has been given to me. That's a backdrop of breakup and uh, immense pressure. And he thought of three and, and I think the last they found him was lying in a garbage bin. Um, so there's a lot of hatred for self uh, and their life. So yes, if you could. And the other one was a threat suicide, uh, swallowing a lot of pills at one go. Um, so what is that threat suicide is what the family was saying, um, you know, was, was there, is there a term like threat suicide? Um, the third was, uh, yeah, there is a, a, a person who was with the family and um, he, uh, high risk behavior, which resulted in a huge accident, loss of uh, uh, livelihood and 
extreme desperation because huge loans, huge commitments, pushing him to a place where he doesn't know uh, how to get out. Um, so yeah, those are three really severe, and they have mentioned the intent. They held on saying, if I don't get a job today, tomorrow would be my last bike ride. And I'm going to take, that's it. That's going to be my last bike ride. So the need is very severe and huge. Yeah, thank you, Jinsi. That's a loaded question. <laughs> but maybe I'll I'll try and uh, bring about um, maybe whatever uh, I remember. So the, the first and foremost thing, like you did say, sometimes um, to be able to uh, discuss this with them indirectly, vis-a-vis uh, -vis directly. Now, I do agree sometimes when, when they are backed in a culture or in a family that, uh, you know, hounding over them and really wouldn't want them to discuss this or, you know, the fear that, you know, if there's a discussion, then you have led them into that. Um, I think we need to be sensitive about that kind of a culture, especially when they are not in a clinical setting. I'm, I'm sure that this is as part of a community that you're helping and, um, um, you know, so that that I, I I believe that is to be done with utmost care. But I think the first and foremost thing, Jinsi, in looking at all of these three um, young men, is one is when there is someone who cares enough to really listen to build that rapport. I've I've uh, noticed that just saying this one sentence, "You are important right now to me," just saying that can often just hold back um, that, uh, you know, that certain impulse because you've just mentioned to them that even though the entire world uh, is against them, you are sitting right here in front of them and you are concerned and you are, uh, you know, you are there to support and to help. That in itself often can work with them moving away this desire to uh, self-harm or to commit suicide and something that I personally do at the end of you know maybe maybe a setting like this um, uh, uh, maybe in a clinical setting it would be probably far different but in a setting like yours uh, is to actually quickly look up um, uh, you know uh, give them something to look forward to, maybe your own presence to really say, you know, tomorrow this time, I really want to come in and spend some time with you some more just to hear you out, right? So can we meet here the same time tomorrow? So what you're doing is actually helping them to extend that impulse, right? So that, um, and if, if you look at a suicide, it comes as a result of extreme emotional pain, extreme emotional dysregulation that brings them there. So the first and foremost thing is to help calm down that dysregulation. And that is a one of it is just showing that support, showing that concern, showing that they are important and, and you, you are concerned and you want to establish a relationship with them to help them in future. Because, uh, you know, maybe saying things like, you know, it's it may not be possible that you may get a job in the next one hour, right? Uh, so you you really want them to, it's like delayed gratification. You're saying, okay, let's let's delay that and let's look at how we can build our, our rapport, our, um, you know, our uh, relationship together. So that's sometimes just letting them know that they are important and that you want to come back and see them. And that's why I said, stay connected to be able to say, you know, I'm going to come back tomorrow at this time to to hear you out. Now that's that can uh, is one thing that can help, and then probably the steps that go after. So the first si first step is probably just staying connected, listening, and ensuring to let them know that you are uh, you you you're concerned, you're there for them, and they are important to you. Uh, I I may not have addressed everything, but um, uh, I hope that answers your question, Jinsi. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jinsi, for that uh, question. And uh, thank you, Jean, for clarifying. Um, if anyone else wants to ask anything, uh, you could. So please feel free to do so. Hi, Jean. This is Nisha. Um, I wanted to uh, just check with you. Um, a, a friend of mine has, has a son who's about 25, and he's been very isolated. And I'm not really in touch with him at all. 
uh, I see, I've seen him as a little child, but over the last few years, he's been intensely violent, intensely intending to, uh, throw, you know, sort of uh, kill himself, and completely locked up uh, to the extent that he's uh, he doesn't even come out. So there's no place of access to him. But recently, uh, through some means, the Lord has opened a door for me to at least communicate with him, and it's he he thinks I don't know about it. So. I was wondering if I should just stay in touch from the point of view of what you mentioned. He did share I'm unwell and I can't help you with this particular assignment. Uh, you know, he did share that. And if I'm well, I'll, you know. So I was wondering what might be a suitable tack of approach in this kind of case. I have a very tiny opening uh, and I'm, you know, just wondering if there's anything that I could do or what you would suggest in this case. I only have access to him through a WhatsApp now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nisha. So the very fact that he's responded to you is in itself uh, a good thing that he is he is able to relate. So um, because it's it's uh, it's at its nascent stages, it's it's really, really um, just the beginning. I'd say take some time to just keep connecting, just connecting at a at a at a regular basis. Maybe one important thing, uh, one thing that you could probably start like an opener is if you've known him previously and you've known him now and you've seen a change, actually saying that, you know, I've noticed that, um, uh, you know, things haven't, haven't, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't seen you in, in a long while or I haven't seen you doing such and such. And, and I was wondering why, is, is there something that I could help or support with? So maybe some opening lines like that where he, he would probably bring out maybe pieces of what he's going through and right, like picking up clues and really heading on with conversations that way. Maybe here, since it's just WhatsApp, maybe may not be a great idea to ask directly at this point of time, but to build okay. rapport and get that opening of like like this right. question. And you know, I've seen you at this okay. uh, at this stage. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. And I'm kind of concerned. Would you like to share something? Yeah. I'll be open to support. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Um, thank you, Jean, for answering Nisha's question. So, Jean, uh, I'll pose a question while you know we wait for others to ask. Uh, so you said uh, that it's it, like you just mentioned that at a nascent stage or the early stage. So how do you tell like, you know, where someone is at if it's just the beginning of them considering these uh, thoughts or if uh, they're way into planning their suicide? How, how can one tell? OK, so um, I just probably want to correct. When I meant by nascent stage to Nisha, I meant nascent stage in her connection with with him, that it's it's just probably the beginning, right? Okay, but um, let's look at how, uh, what would you need to look out for? So as I said, you know, there are, there are some things that we can keep our, um, our attention to. One is, you know, especially if they have gone through significant life events. So it could be the loss um, of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of money, um, something that has, uh, that has, that's been a crisis over them now that's that's uh, usually one of the triggers for some form of depression some form of anxiety to start on the second would be withdrawal um, generally when when people get into depression get into uh, get into anxiety the first thing that you will see is they withdraw from that with anything to do with the, with a social setting so withdrawal and and the third one is yes mood how 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 do they appear have you noticed them over time being quite uh, sad or being you know pervasively anxious these are certain signs that you could actually look out for and um, uh, so in in training whenever uh, we're trained to to question suicide even if they come in with mild or moderate depression, or even if there is a sense of anxiety or a small sense of panic attack, or even if there is an acute uh, event that has happened, you know, we kind of uh, in our in our training we are we are 
asked to ask that because it's important to do that to uh, you know they may be only be contemplating it but nevertheless it's really important to ask and have share that so if you look at it greater i think these would be some of the signs that you would look for sure thank you jean that's uh, really helpful thank you so much good morning everyone uh, good morning jean i have a question for you uh, how do you handle or deal with people who attempt suicide to you know kind of threaten their family members so that their family members don't tell them uh, correct them so they use it as a way to threaten them so that they are left alone and can, they can do what they want and get their way thank you all right thank you selina now uh, there is a, a distinction um, between someone who who emotionally blackmails and that's what you know in our terms we may call it is an emotional blackmail where you threaten to kill yourself if there is something that is that's not done now this can i mean i know families often can just uh, can can really be um you know uh, be shaken by by some of this because it continues to happen there may be minor threats that actually take place um we would we would look at especially those who threaten and uh, to some form of self harm now self harm may not be an intent to die it's probably an intent to um, release that emotional pain and some of that we would see through superficial cuts on the on the hands or on the legs or some parts of the body that is not intended to 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 die but intended to take away emotional pain and this this category of conditions is what we look at a personality issue this is when there are problems with the person with their personality because they are unable to cope with the pressure or unable to cope with what with what is demanded of them so how do families cope i think the first and foremost thing is it is important to get help to get support because when you give in uh, you're not actually helping the person and when you don't give in neither are you helping the person because it tends to become very cyclical it becomes a, a, a cyclical pattern so um, it's important that they get support that they get maybe counseling to ensure that whatever is distressing the individual you know it could be deeper things of their personality the way that they have read life the way the kind of self talk that they build and maybe it's self esteem issues that help them to feel that unless and until everyone does things for them uh, there isn't anything left in them so these could be very many deeper um, issues that need to be dealt with which maybe families or uh, uh, people uh, lay people may not be able to delve into into greater so in conditions like this it's important that they get uh, support they get counseling support uh, to deal with their their inner struggles to, to de deal with their inner psychological uh, and emotional issues that may come about which definitely has an impact on the spiritual side of it so it is to get help to get professional help thank you jean Yeah. Good morning, Jean. This is Ramesh here. I, I have a unique question. I know of this person who is in mid-20s, who runs around to every one of his, his friend and problems that he, they face, especially when they are suicidal. He goes to the hospital, he goes, spends money on them, takes care of them, makes sure that they are brought back, all such things. I am sure if I'm right, more than five, six cases he must have attended in the past three, four years. But what I'm seeing is the kind of reaction of that person. At times, I feel getting into depression and also suicidal. So I was wondering whether it is you need to do something to pre prepare yourself to go be a person who would counsel or take care of a suicidal person, or what kind of prayers or covering that you need to be under so that you do not get into that emotional bonding so my gut feeling was saying that it is possible this person must be really following the whole conversation of whatever they have gone through so when he has a small issue also he also gets into that depression and also suicidal very rarely so i, I really don't know what to say about it but i was wanting to know how do we address this 
so I'm, I wasn't very clear. The person that you said goes and helps is suicidal himself, uh, Brother Ramesh? Yes, by himself, yes. He goes and helps the person who has attempted suicide. He has gone to the hospital, stayed with them two, three days. One person has gone to ICU, stayed and made sure day and night, left the job and just stayed and prayed with them, helped them and brought them back. And they are all fine. But this mm -hmm. person is getting into serious depression nowadays and at times giving up hope every small thing the person is just living what is the uh, is it worth living so i mean what i'm wondering whether it is some kind of a satanic attack or is the person has gone so naive and they are just uh, uh, you know lost their uh, balance you know homeostasis of their uh, mind because mm -hmm. of continuously attending to more of this person has more of suicidal friends if you have to look at the spread more than 50 percent of them are either attempted suicide or only talks about depressive persons or suicidal persons hmm. yeah so i uh, i think um if if the if you're seeing this as a pattern where he's going and helping someone and then gets into a phase of depression probably Mm -hmm. it, it's what we could we we generally may call is is a recurrent depressive disorder that is you know depressive episodes happen over and over and over again in short spans of time and if when there is um, when there is a phase or an episode when he is much better is probably when he is helping but then again you know it seeps seeps back into him so it does have actually talking to someone who is suicidal can actually be very very emotionally draining even for a person who doesn't have depression so i can imagine what it may be for this young person who's helping out but be but really uh, absorbing a lot that is going on because uh, he he may be uh, you know a survivor himself at some point of time so mm -hmm. to to get that uh, to get that break to get that uh, help that um, you know maybe there are times that he may need to step away to ensure that he's taking care of his own spirit his own soul before he's able to actually help someone in turn so if that's someone that if it's a someone that you know it may be good to have a conversation of of how he can balance this help uh, in you know, in uh, balance his help and his own self care so I think that's something um, you know may, maybe a maybe a, a thing to really focus on how he can balance self care and balance uh, this thing of helping others through through their issues. Okay, okay, thank you, Sister Jean. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Brother Ramesh and Jean. We'll uh, have time just for one last question. So uh, I want to request Lyndon, who's raised his hand, to please go ahead and ask the question, Lyndon. So praise the Lord. <clears throat> so I have a, a, a couple of things. First thing, uh, I, I missed the first 10 minutes of the session. I really apologize. But um, in, in, after which, when I joined, uh, I heard uh, Pastor Jean mentioning even someone in faith can have or can go through depression. So it's really hard for them uh, to hear when people say, no, uh, just pray. So it, they need support and uh, so in that context, uh, so uh, someone who is uh, in faith, uh, born again Christian, uh, <clears throat> anointed with the Holy Spirit, and you know they say you no, know, they, they are going through depression, and they have suicidal thoughts, and you know they, they are in a family relationship, and they leave the family, uh, you know, and leave for the parents' house, uh, you know, uh, not not once, but. Uh, uh, you know, a, a few times, uh, and you no know, stays with their uh, parents for uh, a considerably longer amount of time. Uh, so we, we have seen this in our family, uh, and uh, when when we get to speak with uh, you know that that that, that person's parents, uh, they say you no, know, she says uh, she she could commit suicide uh you know when, if, if she had to you know uh, travel to her spouse's house so in, in such cases how do we deal with it could this be relational or personality issues or is it really depression or is it uh, you know uh, how, how do we deal with it as as, as christians or as ministers yes. yeah uh thank you Lyndon, for that question jean we have just a minute left so if you could briefly share but you're free to maybe write a post on the main audi later on sure. yeah sorry to have <laughs> interrupted thank you 
so uh, Lyndon, the, the fact is even when you're assessing someone for any kind of an issue, if you look at a medical issue, you do a holistic assessment, right? So similarly, uh, when you are looking at why a person probably, uh, you know, is it a, uh, presenting himself with depression, you look at a holistic approach. So you look at whether it is, has any kind of clinical basis to it, whether there are family issues, whether there are personality issues, whether there are financial issues, you will look at it holistically. And it may be difficult because I don't, um, you know, I personally don't understand the, the person and the case may be difficult to say this are the pointers. But um, what we are called to do is to ensure that we, we look at all approaches. So I'd say physical, I'd look at emotional, I'd look at their personality, I'd look at their social support, I'd look at their spiritual to really see what exactly it is. So if so we can deal with the source of the problem or source of the depression uh, as, it, as it is. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Lyndon, uh, if you have uh, further questions, follow up questions, please do post on the main Audi. Uh, as we've uh, run out of time, we will have to close right now. But just uh, a big thank you to Jean. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we know that there's so much more we want to know about this, but uh, it's great that we got started discussing these matters. So thank you, everyone. Hope uh, this call has been insightful for each one of you. Uh, have a blessed day. God bless you. We shall connect again on the next call next week. Thank you. Bye for now.